For our next speaker, I would like to call Thomas Watkins uh, on the stage. He's a thought leader, speaker, and industry pr practitioner uh, from Houston, Texas. He's a lifelong learner who has passion for bringing greater clarity to the world. So Great. put your hands together for Thomas. Thank you, everyone, for this very uh, important talk that is kind of very near and dear to me. As a, uh, as a topic, DVUX, Data Visualization Plus UX for dashboards, interfaces, and presentations. I just wanted to start off by talking about the problem. This just happens to be a very, this is a small picture I just got and threw into the slide because it's very, very relevant. It, uh, it's from the uh, Hurricane Ian, you may have, may have heard in the United States, there's been a recent hurricane that's caused a lot of devastation. And Florida is not new at all to hurricanes, but recently there's been revived talk about having to redo the way hurricane cones are visualized. Meteorologists tend to look at it in terms of the eye of the hurricane instead of the scope of the, da the, uh, the danger. So recently, um, social scientists have been ki kind of called upon to take a second look at how do we uh, visualize the, um, the hurricane paths. And this is sort of an um, intro into the impact that data visualization has. Now, this talk is going to be getting into the nitty-gritty of the design psychology, so I hope you're excited about that. Um, but to, to kind of dive into this topic, I'm going to use examples from business intelligence that we kind of um, show of hands, how many folks here are designers, UX designers? Okay, good. So I'm in a room full of designers, so we're all very familiar with this stuff. Um, now, what I'm going to show you for the next few slides is I'm going to show you data twice with two different visualizations, and I'm going to ask a question, and I'd like you to tell me which visualization you chose to answer the question. Ready? Okay. This is going to be a little bit interactive, this, this, uh, this talk, so I hope you're enthused about that. Um, which channel had the greatest amount of user engagement? Anybody? You can just blurt out answers. <laughs> See, the, the last one? Exchange? Which, which graph did you use to, to make that determination? B? Okay. The next one is, uh, how does Litware compared to worldwide imports. Litware on the um, tree graph mosaic is uh, the, the upper pink corner, and then the, the uh, purple one in the middle is uh, worldwide importers. How do those two compare with each other? And which graph did you use to make that determination? Okay, and then for the next one, which manufacturer had the most volatile uh, changes over time, over the, over the course of the quarters. Okay, uh, uh, four. Any other? Some people say one, some people say four. Which, which visualization are you using to make that judgment? B. So I think, I think you probably are picking up on the point here, is in, um, that some graphs are just... Uh, they cater more to how we actually want to operate when we, um, when we are trying to explore something for data. And these come from real dashboards. These were not just invented to make a, uh, to make a um, bad example. So this one comes from Power, uh, the first one came from Power BI. Um, you can see the, the gauge charts. They use things, it, it encodes data using things that we're bad at um, decoding. Um, and a, a bunch of other things, examples that you know, we could go through. I won't go through them all, but you see the donut chart, which you know, doesn't scale very well when it comes to you know, being able to compare things. It uses slices and two-dimensional volume to encode vet data. We see some charts that are in the upper kind of middle area that are you know, densely packed together, a lot of um, noise in the data. Um, the second... Uh, Dashboard, this also is a Power BI example. The, um, the last one that you saw is a mosaic, uh, no, I'm sorry, not a mosaic, a, um, a sand key diagram that looks pretty cool, but is pretty, it's kind of hard to, to, uh, to read. So this is kind of a pervasive thing all across the industry of just 
uh, data visualizations being difficult to use, the, um, opting for data art when we should be doing data visualization, and um, overall not going for communication. Here's a couple of examples I'll just show really quick of data displays that actually do cater to uh, communication. Um, uh, this one has a trellis plot of some line, uh, spark lines, some dot plots in the upper right hand uh, area to, co to compare uh, quantities, and um, a scatter plot in the bottom middle and some bar graphs. And it uses color in a responsible way to where it's, uh, it's, it's referring to a category throughout the screen. Um, so you can really map on the colors to actual meaning. Um, here's another example of a chart that was, uh, that was a, a, a winner or a runner-up winner in a Stephen Few um, contest uh, years and years ago. It's a dashboard for, um, for uh, uh, school teachers who are teaching math um, classes. So anyway, um, good, getting into the topic, DVUX, data visualization plus UX. This isn't a commonly used term yet. I hope it kind of catches on a little bit. but. Uh, so it's just data visualization plus UX. They re really shouldn't have to be fused together as if they're two different things. They should be kind of the same thing or part of the same, you know, under the same umbrella because it all deals with the question of um, how do we make things as easy as possible uh, to users and cater to the users. So I'm going to go through this talk with three different lenses. The foundational lens is going to be the practitioner. That's us as individual practitioners. What should we do regarding DVUX, data visualization? What are, the, what are the things that we should ground ourselves in and be doing every day um, if this is a topic that we decide we care about? Then the organization layer, um, if you're a manager or a director, if you're responsible for a group of uh, folks, designers at a company, or an organization, how do we think about DVUX on that level, data visualization? And then kind of the last one on the uh, highest level, the profession. What do we as designers think about um, as this relates to our entire profession and what we, what we care about? So at the practitioner lens, I'd like to get us kind of all grounded in the design psychology of data visualization. And to do that, I don't want to tell it to you, I want to kind of just de demonstrate it so that you'll, you'll believe me. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about, let's get into color. Um, there are two uh, chunks of just numbers, and then I want you to count the number of fives within the chunk, and it's the same chunk of numbers. Okay, how many fives? And which, this, which, uh, which one did you use to make that decision? Of course, it's the bottom one. Um, so this shows how color is just used naturally to facilitate um, uh, uh, being able to perceive things. Here's the next thing, uh, 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 the cognitive phenomenon of, of interference. And for the cognitive psychologists who have every, already heard of this effect, I want you to um, pretend you don't know what this is. And, um, and if I can get a, a volunteer from the crowd, uh, all you have to do is just read um, words. Okay, okay. So, someone back there? Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to um, say the name of colors. <laughs> where, where are you? Can you raise your hand so I can see you? Okay, great. Great. This, this, the, yeah, this is, this is super easy. And I'm going to time you. No pressure. Um, so, so, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this twice. So the, the first time, just um, read, or just don't read, say the name of the caller from, from left to right, top to bottom. Ready? I've got a timer here on my phone. Go. Great, great, so, awesome, awesome, that's so wonderful. It, it, please don't kill me, we're going to do that one more time. It's, it's, that was about 20 seconds, I, I stopped that uh, one second late. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so okay, so we're going to get ready to do that again. That was about 20 to 21 seconds. All right, ready. <laughs> oh, awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So for those who don't, does it, who knows what that's called? Anyone know what that's called? Cognitive psychologists in the house? That's a, called the Stroop, the Stroop effect. Um, so basically what it talks about is how we have systems, different systems in our minds that compete and they can interact with each other. We have a well-practiced subroutine for reading, and that's what you saw demonstrated there, and that kicked off and got activated when uh, looking at words, and then the less practiced subroutine of color. And that's just a demonstration of how there's a lot going on when we're talking about design psychology. We have multiple systems going on in our mind, and it's, we have to use, be careful about how we use the attributes um, that we use when we're designing. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, once again. So the next one we're going to do is uh, magnitude judgments, right? So I'm going to show you two objects. One is going to be bigger than the other, and I want you to uh, just say how much bigger is the bigger object. Like, is it twice as big, three times as big, and so forth. Cool. All right, we'll jump right in. Okay, B is twice as big. Looks like. So I hear eight, I hear 10. Someone said 16. So the actual answer is it's 16 times bigger. And um, so that's, that's very interesting. Now, there's two kind of things that were noticeable there. One, the speed, and two, the accuracy. So with the first one, perfect accuracy and pretty near instant speed, right, in, in terms of judging the magnitude of the two objects. And the second one, much less longer. In fact, you started off with a laugh and, uh, and um, much less sure about what it was. So this... This operates according to a law, um, Stevens' power law. This is the, there's a log version of the equation if you're interested in looking it up, but this version of the equation comes from Naomi R Robbins' book, and I'll show you the book later. Um, and so beta, the beta uh, piece here, one would equal perfect ability to map what y the actual quantity is with what you're perceiving. So when we're talking about judging the lengths of lines, for example, that hovers around one, we have more perfect, near perfect ability to see the length of something. The second one is judging the area of something. That's what you were doing in the second task, trying to compare the area of two different circles. You can see here that we dramatically underestimate these things naturally. And then for uh, for volume, then it really goes downhill in terms of our ability to perceive it accurately. So you could see, you could start uh, seeing it coming together when you're choosing what type of graph or chart and you're encoding data onto it, what types of features you use for it have a really profound impact to how people, uh, how easily people can um, detect uh, what is going on. Okay, so the next one is when we're looking at the visual attributes of different uh, things, different objects, our ability to separate the attributes in our mind and in our, our perception is easier or difficult depending on the, um, uh, the task. So for this one, I'll just describe it. I won't, I won't make you go through and do this. But um, if you uh, take a look at this one, which objects are filled in ver versus which ones are blank, notice how you can instantly see. You don't even have to try. You can kind of see all the filled in ones together, all the blank ones together. Perceptually, you can automatically categorize it, and it's very easy. Those are, that's very easy to separate from the location on the screen or the height and the width of the uh, boxes, for example. Um, this one, the ones at the top versus the ones at the bottom, very easy to separate from any other attribute of the rectangles. Um, but then if... Uh, 
but if I uh, were to ask you to just say, okay, look at the tall objects versus the wide objects, that would be very difficult to separate. You kind of see them together. In fact, our perception blends them together into just an overall concept of size and magnitude. So um, that's an, another attribute. And the last one that I want to uh, wrap up with here is contextual cues. I think you can probably tell that these circles are the same size, although they look like they're two different size, sizes because of the contextual cues around them. So this is a gestalt effect, um, and it's called the Ebbinghaus illusion, that the, you know, when you're dealing with certain kinds of objects, if the, the position of other things around it can change the way we perceive them. So um, that was a whole smattering of just uh, visual attributes, our ability to judge things, our ability to see things. And I like to do these as a demonstration because you can kind of prove to yourself that it's real. It's not just a lecturer up here telling you this is the way things operate. You can kind of see live that these, um, these effects come into play. And fortunately, there's a set of rules that have been mapped out. So from the top to bottom, these are the most accurate at the top to the least accurate at the bottom in terms of our ability to map on visual attributes to quantitative value. So at the very top, really, um, <clears throat> uh, the top three are all, all very close to each other. It's how far are things apart, position on a two-dimensional space, so like how you would have in a, in a dot plot, for example, um, or the length of lines. So we're really accurate at those top three things. So when it comes to mapping on quantity, to those things and uh, a situation where it's important for people to be able to make judgments um, about the quantity of different metrics, then that plays a role in what we might uh, choose. A dramatic drop in, um, in our ability to accurately do it is the angle or the slope of lines. So you saw that in the gauge map, the, the, uh, the gauge charts, where you rely totally on the angle of a gauge meter to tell where something, um, how much something is. And then we have an even uh, steeper drop in accuracy, our ability to judge and compare areas, and then onto volume, and then co uh, uh, color or hue is the last. Now don't, um, don't uh, get confused by the last one. We should, can and should use color all the time in data visualization, but in terms of mapping it onto specific quantitative values, that's what we would be bad at. So if something, if one red was 90% more red than another one, we would be very bad at making that judgment. But it could be used in other areas where you need to promote categorical perception, for example. Okay, so those are some things that are kind of the foundation of visual language that we can, um, that we can uh, uh, take with us as designers when we're, when we're doing data visualization. And I want to offer this <clears throat> perspective that there's kind of, in my work, I've noticed that there's three different mentalities that there are when approaching data visualization. There's the technologist, where the big win is just getting the data visualization to render, right? And so a lot of times if things are run by kind of the development department, you'll kind of th see things steered in that direction. <clears throat> Another mentality is the artist. A lot of managers, executives fall into this category where they want to express themselves with the data visualization. So the data is an after, afterthought, but the final visual, that's what they uh, really want to see. They say, I want to see, you know, a Sankey diagram or, or a donut chart and, you know, not really thinking about um, how is this data visualization going to be used. And the last one is what I would advocate as the real solution that you want to go for, which is as the communicator. And think about it this way. You're translating from one language into another, from the language of the math and the statistics into the language of, of the sensory, perceptual, and cognitive systems of the person that you're communicating with. And um, you're the translator. So you're a, you, as the designer with an awareness of the language of, of the system of how we kind of operate can translate the needed insights into, into that language to help people be, be able to gain insights from their, uh, from their data visualizations. So that is, um, and, and, and here's some, uh, my recommended reading list and study list, and I'll come back to this, I'll show this again at the end. 
Um, but uh, in terms of as a practitioner, if you want to seriously say, you know what, I actually want to get good at this data visualization thing. I really kind of want to know um, what I'm talking about here. This is the list that I would strongly, strongly rep recommend with um, uh, emphasis, I think, on Stephen Few, but we could talk about that a little bit um, at the end. So going back to our three lenses, that was kind of the practitioner lens where we're looking at what do we as a practitioner think, uh, uh, think about and use to approach our work. And a lot of that, that was grounded in design psychology, which we use every day as part of our jobs. So let's take a look at the organization layer of things. Um, and, you know, what are the things that we can do to kind of make this DVUX practice better with regard to um, with our, our work and our teams. So the first thing is that uh, data visualization is very removed from UX. Um, I found with working with a, and consulting with a wide variety of companies, the, um, uh, this is for a variety of reasons. So one is that the skill sets are not normally there for most of us designers. Most of us don't have a statistics background, unless a little bit, unless if we come out of the uh, social sciences. But um, in terms of like heavy use of statistics and a strong understanding of data and rows and columns and variables and all these kind of things, the skill sets and the foundation often isn't totally there. And that's okay, I wanna make the point that the goal here isn't to say, all designers should become experts in data visualization, but it should be a little bit more present in um, our work the same way uh, accessibility, for example, is. We're not all experts in accessibility, but we all know roughly where it fits, and then there are specific designers who are experts in that who we can bring onto our teams to be able to handle those um, problems uh, in depth. So the skill set gap, the skill set's kind of not really there for a lot of us. Um, the other thing is the departments. The departments that are viewed as being in charge of the data, it's usually another department, data visualization, is another department. Sometimes it's the marketing department, particularly if you're doing a lot of analytics at your company, and that's seen as kind of the domain um, of the uh, folks on that side of the company. Um, data viz, data science uh, uh, departments, oftentimes kind of like control the whole, um, you know, the from design to implementation, what should be done uh, with regard to data visualizations. And the last part is just self-selection. A lot of times we kind of opt out of taking on those battles. I mean, when was the last time you heard a designer argue, you know, uh, feverishly over whether to use, you know, a, a dot plot versus a donut chart versus some of these things. A lot of times we kind of set out those battles and we don't get into kind of the specific nitty gritty on those, on those uh, things. Um, so what I kind of want to advocate here is when we're thinking about on an organizational level, a lot of that deals with the question of strategy, features as they come in, where do these things belong, um, the early design thinking of how would this feature manifest in our product, right? And a lot of that has to do a little bit with our, um, our uh, data visualization pattern vocabulary. So I'm gonna do an exercise here um, uh, uh, after a kind of a, a, a brief overview of these four high-level patterns of how a data visualization appears in a product, okay? So we've got the dashboard. I think we have a, a, somewhat of a familiarity of what a dashboard, I'm gonna get more specific as to what exactly I mean by dashboard, but a dashboard screen, okay? You have data query screens, which deal with data visualization. You have reports, which also deal with data visualization. And you have what I'm gonna call here UI components, or I'm calling it on the slide micro components, data visualizations that, can com that appear on a screen that otherwise would have another uh, purpose. So is it really a dashboard? This, uh, a lot of times the, uh, the feature or an epic comes in and says, okay, we need to build a dashboard. Show of hands, do you work at a place where you've been asked to design a dashboard or the das dashboards is a feature? Now dashboards can mean, um, almost anything, right? So when people say dashboard, they're really in modern times just saying a screen with charts on it, right? And so um, to here we're gonna parse that and get a little bit more granular on um, is it really a dashboard? 
So uh, a series of questions, and um, they're all going to start off with a user story claiming that a dashboard is needed, but we're going to see, do we think that that is a dashboard, or is it one of the other screens that I'm going to uh, dive deep in describing? Um, okay, so for this first one, if you um, would like to pull out your phones and vote for this one, on this one, the, uh, by scanning the QR code, you should be able to get to the question. And I don't know if it's a different QR code for each one, but we'll see. So for the first one, I'll read the question. We need a dashboard because the analyst needs to dynamically explore metrics for patterns. What do we think that is? Do we think that is a dashboard, a data query screen, a report, or a UI component? Everyone had an opportunity to vote? Okay, I'll go to the next slide if I think that a bunch of people have voted. Awesome, look at that. I see some people are, some people, okay, so people are still answering. Um, in the other ones, despite the right answer being shown, that's, that's uh, tenacity. So um, <clears throat> as, as most, and, and the other ones aren't, so by the way, this, these questions don't necessarily really have a right or a wrong because that could also be a report, right? And it could be a dashboard as well. But um, what is perhaps most suitable for this? Um, so that one, the answer that I would give for that one is data query screen. Um, uh, I'm trying to remind myself that this isn't a class, and I, I want to ask some folks what, uh, wh wh why, for those of you who put data query screen, can, uh, any comments on to, as to why? Dynamic. That's right. That's right. So the need to slice and dice the data to do stuff with it, that's not necessarily a dashboard. And you could squeeze that, um, that functionality onto a dashboard if you wanted to, but um, that might not be the best option. You might have to put lo load your dashboard with lots of functionality, for example, that you don't um, that messes up other purposes to it. Okay, so let's do let's do another one. Um, we need a dashboard because the insurance admin starts off the day by reviewing the incoming claims, assignments for each adjuster, and outstanding tasks. Okay. So what is this? Is this uh, most suitable, in your opinion, on, for a dashboard, a data query screen, a report, or a UI component on another screen that has another purpose? A minute for that. Okay, are we about ready? Okay. Let's see the next slide. Okay, so this this is an interesting one. This this very well uh this very well could have been a report. This could be a report, right? Um the reason why I would shoot for dashboard for this one. Um, anyone who picked dashboard who wants to offer maybe a reason why you picked dashboard? Excellent, excellent. So lots of things to look at at one time. That situation very often really lends itself to a dashboard, particularly when we're dealing with different data sets, totally different data sets and they matter to a person. Another one of the clues here is um, the, uh, a, a job role was called out here, right? So, and they start their day. So this is kind of like a situation. Someone starts their day, they sit down, and they're going to be looking at a display to kind of orient them. Maybe for that situation, maybe you want a dashboard, right? To kind of see like, okay, what is all of the data that I'm going to be dealing with? What are the relevant things that I should be thinking about as I'm making decisions in the day? This could also be a report, and, and we'll see with some of the report examples later. But um, I picked dashboard for this one because I'm a big fan of um, job role-oriented stuff that, um, that, uh, 
that uh, goes to a dashboard. It's interesting to see that the dashboard one is growing <laughs> over the course of this conversation. Um, so, okay, for the next one, we need a dashboard because the, exec, the execs need to see the quarterly numbers. What do we think for this one? Is this, is this a dashboard? Um, is it a data query screen? Is it a report? Is it a UI component? Okay. All right, so for this one, Report. Okay, so overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly report. Anyone want to comment on why you opted for report? It's a summary. It's right. It just it just really lends itself to a report. What is the um? It, it you know it has that kind of. Uh, you also get the impression since it's an exec that's just going to be re reviewing the numbers that there's this kind of pragmatic interest to it. Probably not a lot of deep diving into a lot of data questions. It's, it's probably serving up kind of a top level of, of a um, uh, summary of what the data is saying. Okay, great. Um, next one. We need a dashboard because an engineer is monitoring the pumping volume and speed of the fluid coming from the well. Um, I live in Texas. We, we have a lot of oil pumping uh, use cases in our software. Um, so what, what is this one? Is this, a, is this a dashboard, a data query screen, a report, or a UI component? Think about that. Seconds for you to think about it. Okay, so this one, Wow. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> so, okay, so this one, you know, uh, I've got this as dashboard, but let's, let's talk about the UI component one. And of course, dashboard's growing. It, it, you, you don't need to do that. Um, so, so for some of the UI component, I, I want to I ask about that one. What, that was overwhelmingly the choice given here. Um, why is that? It's, I hope it's not just because that wasn't the, the one that we had an answer for yet. <laughs> it, yeah, it, and, and it could be. So here's the case for that being a UI component, I think. Um, if we're talking about you're using a screen where you're doing lots of stuff, and that, you know, by the way, I want to see some metrics to go along with that, you could definitely make a case, and it could definitely be very effective as a UI component. So that's definitely... Um, uh, uh, that definitely can be a right answer there. With dashboard, I think of that as a dashboard because it's, a, it's what's called a situation awareness display. A situation awareness display. Um, part of the definition of a dashboard, the classical definition of a dashboard is that it's a one screen display of information and there's a lot of things we add on to that like can have stuff from different data sets the top most important things from any given situation. But kind of having a, a situation awareness the way you do in your car, that's literally a dashboard and it has a, the top metrics that, um, uh, th that you care about, your fuel, your speed, and other things like that. So um, I have dashboard for that, but that could certainly be some of the other ones, uh, even data query screen, but I uh, prefer dashboard for that one. How about this one? We need a dashboard because the foreman needs to see how many outstanding tasks there are while scrolling through the crew's daily activities. What do we think for this one? Dashboard, data query screen, report, or UI component? This one, I'll tell you now that this could really be, this, uh, there's, a, there's a number of good answers for this one, I think. All righty. 
Yep. Yep, I have this one as a UI component. I, th I think probably for the same reason uh, uh, that I do, which is that it's you're doing something, you're doing a task, and then you just have some components that help you make decisions about this, but you're probably looking at like some kind of a list or something like that, and your data visualization plays um, a supporting role in that screen, um, although that could also be uh, the other ones as well. So... Okay, so this one, I think this is the last one. A auditor needs um, to audit historical information with a set of questions that are difficult to predict. So you as the designer, you as the organization may not be able to easily predict what this auditor is going to have to um, uh, uh, see. So dashboard, data query screen, report, or UI component. Right? So for this one, yeah, I definitely have data query screen. Great. <clears throat> that was the overwhelming um, choice. Anyone want to comment on why you feel it was a data query screen? I don't, can, can you raise your hand? I don't see where you are. Okay, great. Yeah, that's right. And so, you know, with this being difficult to predict, the user is going to have to go into the data and they're going to have to do stuff with it. This is a situation where you're going to want a uh, data query screen, most likely. Now, um, oh, I put in one more in here. I forgot about this. I did this last time. Okay, one, this, I think this is the last one. A manager loves to consume productivity metrics in a very consistent format with very specific time windows. We think that is dashboard, data query screen, report, UI component. Great. So, yes. You know, okay, so th this is very interesting. Um, I definitely think report, but it could also be a dashboard. And of course, you see dashboard shrinking. <laughs> Human behavior, you got to love it. Um, yeah, so, uh, so for those who chose report, anyone want to comment, offer an, an idea on why report? Y can you wave your hand? Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. It, the, the time frame, that time frame is a really good indicator of wanting a report. You could also do a dashboard for this. If this is a manager who wants to see a display on a screen and it revolves around a situation where you can design around that situation, it certainly could be a dashboard. I opt for thinking about this as a report, but it could be, it could be either one of those. Um, excellent. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of to review on these patterns, we've got as we've got all these user stories coming into our departments, we're trying to figure out what we're doing with these. Do they dis, do, uh, belong to the data science department or the UX department? They should belong to our departments. But what are these features? Dashboards, revolving around a situation, revolving around often a persona, right? This is a, a, an awesome use case for dashboards, right? You might have multiple data sets that carry to a uh, uh, or one data set that caters to multiple different personas. Each of those personas might look at the data and interact with it and decide um, on it in different ways. So that's a great opportunity for a dashboard. A data query screen. 
those situations where people really need to get in there and dynamically slice and dice the data to be able to run filters on them and do stuff with them. Great op opportunity for that. Related to that is a report because oftentimes a report is an output from a data query screen. Um, a report oftentimes more static, right? Where it's a snapshot, this is a situation, you know, when you think of like a literal report that you might print up and, and um, put on a, 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 a stakeholder's desk and um, have them look at the metrics. It caters often communicationally around a certain set of questions. Um, and very often a data query screen will output a report, um, perhaps in the form of like a PDF or something like that. Um, and then UI components are another area where data visualizations come to life in our designs. So, um, so with that, in, in thinking about data visualization and the role of data visualization in our work, um, you know, uh, and why isn't it there already? I think that oftentimes with our questions of data visualization, there's a granularity disparity in the way UX folks approach our work and oftentimes the type of questions you would need in order to really test a data visualization. So for example, you might say, um, uh, I've got an app where people can see their health metrics, their exercise metrics, and it's a dashboard where when you're testing it, you basically just ask the user like, okay, can you do your overall task that aren't, isn't necessarily related to being able to really, really um, discern the data in a very clear way. And they might be able to be successful at the overall task, but oftentimes you didn't really test the data visualization. What I'd like to offer is if we really want to care about that aspect of it, we want to ask questions at another level of granularity in order to capture whether those data visualizations are the best they can be. Um, so for example, if the user needs to make certain decisions with the data, ask them in the test to say, um, uh, just the, the way I started off this presentation, which sales channel is doing the best at X, Y, and Z? Or how are sales doing this year in terms of uh, these factors? And have them actually solve problems with the data visualizations and even pit some against each other to really get our uh, testing at that granularity. And um, this is something that we can uh, incorporate into our research programs um, when we're doing our UX investigations because that ultimately drives what we think is necessary from a design perspective. And oftentimes if we're not testing for it, we're not gonna be aware that we need to do more from a data visualization perspective. Okay, so, um, and, uh, and from a hiring and training perspective, um, Data viz or this DVUX stuff that I'm talking about is hard to find for. I personally know this because I consult at the intersection a lot of data visualization and UX. And a lot of times there's a lack in a UX department, um, which is uh, why that extra piece is sometimes needed. Um, it's something that I think will take a lot of time, but what I want to say is that it's it, uh, statistics primarily as a skill set. It's not a branch of graphic design. It seems to be graphic design because what you get in the end is uh, visual graphics, but it's um, when we're training ourselves for it or when we're hiring for it or adding on to our UX teams with it, you want to see if you can find folks that have a, um, a little bit of a stats background and, a, and also um, are, uh, have learned from some of those, um, uh, those book authors that um, I showed before and I'll show again um, in, a, in a few slides. So uh, returning back to our three lenses, the practitioner, the organization, and then the profession. So we've done the first two, so let's talk a little bit about the profession. And this is a shorter session, uh, section because it relate, what we're doing now is really one of the, um, the action items for that. But I wanna challenge us to think about our profession and the way it's changed over the past 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I remember when um, I first started kind of getting started in UX around 15-ish years ago, um, there was a lot of job role responsibilities that were gradually shifting into UX that weren't really there before. So a lot of the stuff that product managers 
um, used to be totally responsible for. We uh, kind of uh, took over a lot of those responsibilities over time. Uh, strategy over the years, there's been kind of a, a bigger emphasis on uh, UX folks being more knowledgeable about business strategy and things like that. Um, the second uh, bullet point I've got here is kind of the role of, of uh, graphic designers on our profession. I remember a long time ago, people used to ask for CVs um, on job interviews. Uh, that's the curriculum vita, what kinds of research have you done? But then nobody asked for a portfolio years ago. Not that I can remember. Um, anyone been here f uh, for 15 years or longer who remembers people asking for portfolios that long ago? I don't think it was uh, terribly common. But that's the impact of graphic design, especially with the rise of mobile, where you need kind of a more, um, graphic design's a little bit more integrated with the regular UX design. And graphic design made the profession better by bringing in all of those um, skill sets. And the last example that I have here is the role of access accessibility. Accessibility has, for decades, been its own profession. There's people who do, you know, just accessibility. Um, but in the past five to ten years, you might have noticed that that's taken on a way increased role in our profession as UX professionals, right? It used to be like maybe ten years ago, accessibility was, are you accounting for red-green colorblindness and is, are the contrasts enough? But nowadays, there's a lot more thought and effort um, put into accessibility. So I'm using these as an ana analogy for our profession does change over time, and it takes on new skills and skill sets already um, as a part of its evolution. And I think that that's uh, something that's appropriate for a data visualization as well. Why shouldn't um, data visualization be a part of our profession? What we do for a living is we're design psychologists who take into account sensory perceptive and cognitive systems of humans and design things so that it's as easy as possible for people to do the test that they're doing. Well, that's definitely data visualization, right? That when people perceive data, they should be able to um, uh, process that stuff in the, in the way that's best for their decision making. So how do we achieve, achieve this? I think that this is largely um, uh, what we have here today, conferences, kind of um, evangelizing the topic more, but as a part of our profession. Um, I've personally found that uh, clubs and study groups and things like that, where you get a, a group of um, data nerds in a room who kind of uh, um, play around with different uh, data sets. I was telling a developer friend of mine um, one time about uh, these meetups that, were, that would happen on Saturday mornings where they would show a data set and everyone challenges themselves to see if they can visualize it and you know, um, then you compare what you came up with in the middle of the day. I said, you should really check it out. It's called a data jam. My friend was like, that sounds terrible. I <laughs> am not interested in going to a data jam. Um, but, uh, but things like that where we're kind of practicing and exercising our skills and trying to uh, get more comfortable with the domain of data um, that is something that helps make a lot of this stuff more possible. And just all around incorporating this stuff more and more into our culture as uh, UX uh, pract practitioners. And um, to show that reading list again, um, here it is. These are the, uh, the authors. I'll, ju I'll just kind of go over them high, le high level. Naomi Robbins probably wrote the best book that is both a reference and educational on what types of charts that you can use. So that's creating more effective graphs. Um, uh, Stephen Few in the upper right-hand area, um, that's the world's leader in data visualization. Um, spent uh, decades really uh, educating folks on the particulars of how you address uh, um, data visualization for, for different user interface goals. Um, William Cleveland takes on a very statistics-based focus um, in data visualization. Edward Tufte, probably the most famous, the grandfather of data visualization back in the 80s, um, really evangelized the idea that we should be designing data to communicate and not just making graphs for the heck of it. And um, over in the lower right-hand corner, Alberto, Alberto Cairo, if you're interested in the infographics um, side of things, 
um, and where you're allowed to have a little bit more artistic and journalistic liberty with the way you make graphs and uh, data visualizations come to life. So this has been a topic that I've been um, into for um, very much the past uh, uh, 13 years or so, evangelizing it. Um, going around giving talks, and then I hope that some of you will be interested in pursuing this as well um, and making it more a part of our profession. Thank you. <laughs>